answer the last few questions. Um, the first one concerns air velocity. It is all, it's also an important factor for comfort. How do you think about relationship between ventilation rates and air velocity? Um, well, I guess I can uh, I can say that from the beginning there. Of course, uh, you know I'm pretty concerned about um, uh, about about the uh, draft and uh, and uh, air velocity in the uh, uh, in the occupied zone. That's not something, especially in a, in a mechanical system, that I that I want to see. Um, so, in terms of the, uh, the 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 relationship between them, uh, unless I've, I've misunderstood the question. I would say that you know they they are in incredibly uh, important, and it's more to do with make sure you've got the, you're getting the correct distribution into the occupied zone uh, rather than the actual rate, to so make sure you're not getting any spots with draft, and that's really a question for uh, the occupied zone at least to make sure you've got the air diffuser designed correctly. And I think it is something which is in Europe at least which is not considered or not given enough. Um, uh, seriousness to fall in the design stage. I think it's very much down to uh, the cheapest possible type of uh, uh, diffusers rather than actually getting, making sure that the, the last part of the puzzle uh, getting the air into the room is actually, is actually given uh, the, the correct uh, priority during selection. Uh, I hope that answers the question. I don't know if you have anything to add there, Peter. Yes, I, I think you've touched on a very important point there, the fact that um, the diffusers quite often uh, do not have the correct flow characteristic when you're coming into a, um, uh, an inhabited area, a, a working environment. Uh, this is more commonly experienced in sort of places like clean rooms and process areas uh, rather than the uh, domestic situation. But uh, again, it's nonetheless important for all you know, all areas that um, you have that final terminal device that actually puts the air when you, where you want it. Um, so yes, it is important. Uh, and again, that's why we have standalone devices as well, so you can actually deliver clean air at point of need. Thank you very much. Uh, second question, how do you regulate the individual owner to get HVACR system? tested and checked and maintained as per design criteria? Well, that's, a, that's a really good question. and I think that's actually a, a pretty hot topic, uh, especially here in Sweden at the moment. We have, a, we have a lot of guidelines and regulations that say how we should be doing it through EPBD, for example. But when it actually comes to following up, um, then, uh, you know, I think a lot of countries have a, have a long way to go. Um, and say so in, uh, in in Sweden today, if I just look at uh, my home country here, um, you know, where it's, a lot of it is really to do with um, there, there there are these ventilation controls, but that's really more from a, a safety perspective uh, rather than actually a, a, an IAQ perspective. Uh, I, I would say I think the onus needs to be put more onto the uh, onto that and making sure that we are actually delivering a system that we say we should. Today, uh, I believe in our, in our legislation, it does say we should have these two-year checks um, after a new building is completed, as specified in EQBD. But it seems to be a little bit of a mess about who actually pays for that and who actually does that checking up. It's very down to, to the local level, and I would say, in my opinion, it's not working very well, and I'm pretty sure it's the case in a lot of other countries as well. Peter, I don't know if you see... Yes, uh, I can certainly uh, enlarge on that theme. I mean, I think it's somewhere, um, yeah, the REHVA uh, could quite usefully get involved in this sort of area of indoor air quality um, monitoring and uh, surveying and auditing, um, you know, the indoor environments of buildings. It's something I've been doing a bit <laughs> of uh, in terms of particle counting and uh, gas testing. Of course, CO2 uh, testing is commonplace. Uh, to check for dead spots in, in building um, um, areas, um, and so it's quite uh, quite pertinent. And there's a lot of um, you know worry that with energy efficiency being the focus, that uh, people are turning down and turning off plant when the indoor air quality uh, side of it isn't being checked. And uh, um, you know the performance. I, I of that. guess one thing we should mention, Peter, is uh, you know the work we're doing through ISERB at the moment. So it might be a good idea to. Uh, to give people a link to the ISA website. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, 
uh, ISERV is a, is a research project where we're actually looking at um, how do we most efficiently check how a building is being operated and being run uh, and is it actually fulfilling the criteria necessary for the type of activity being performed in that building and i.e. what is that building being used for uh, and is there, you know, for, for the age of the building and the sort of activity going on, uh, is it used in an appropriate amount, amount of energy? Uh, and I know that this project is look, looking to be fed in to the, uh, to the next EPBD. EPB uh, so, you know, th this is something being, being taken quite seriously, and I think we will see a lot of movement on this in the future. Yes, they do have a focus on uh, mainly on the energy side, but there is some content there referring to indoor air quality, yeah. and uh, that could probably, you know, be expanded or should be expanded for future uh, use. Thank you very much. Um, now we have another question. Uh, RH 40-60% uh, source reference, and does this mean that the indoor air must be humidified during winter in Northern Europe with the risk of mites, dampness, and mold? Certainly, um, uh, relative humidity uh, does vary from country to country, so uh, uh, this is um, something which does need uh, greater attention in um, you know, damper climates. Uh, I'm sure in southern Europe uh, it's uh, uh, not a problem in terms of um, high levels of relative humidity. Um, but uh, in terms of the design of the plant, it needs to be considered. Um, certainly in the UK, uh, for large parts of the year, um, humidity isn't a problem. Um, and that's why we haven't uh, dwelt on that. As far as air filtration is concerned, we recommend that uh, filters uh, are changed much more regularly if there is a damp um, uh, high humid, relative humidity level uh, experience because you can get an increase in microbial growth and uh, poor air quality, indoor air quality as a result. Maybe I can add, sorry to interrupt, but uh, can ahead. I add something to that, uh, John, sorry? <laughs> no, actually, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's good to 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 uh, make a remark that in the European standard EN 15251, when we made this, we also had this discussion. And I, I don't have the exact line here, but it says something that uh, normally, if you look at at buildings used by people, it's not really necessary to humidify. So this is for the whole of Europe. And it, it basically tells you that if you do have certain uh, processes like printing paper or maybe a museum where you want to protect the paintings or whatever, there could be a reason to humidify the air. But uh, that normally it's not necessary, also not in Northern Europe. There have been a couple of studies from DTU, especially uh, Lai Fang. He did a couple of papers end of the 90s together with uh, Fanger, Fang and Fanger. And uh, they also find, found that, uh, like normally, if you stay above 20, 25 percent, there's not really an issue. Only if you go down really low, like 10 percent, 10, 15 percent, then uh, sensitive people uh, might get some, some, some symptoms, some complaints. But normally, it's not, not necessary to humidify uh, in winter in, in standard buildings like offices and schools. So. Thank you, Atze. Anything to add, John? Just a little bit, and, and to those who I guess, I mean, you know, in uh, in Sweden here in the winter, even though you have very high relative humidity, you know, my it's still incredibly, incredibly dry. Um, yeah. You know, and, uh, and and you get even the guys getting there, you know, they're moisturised, moisturised out because their their hands are cracking up. So <laughs> mm -hmm. that Norwegian hand cream still, uh, you know, yeah. still sells a lot here in the winter. So. You know, I, I'm not sure if I'd want to spend any energy on it uh, in, in my building, but, um, you know, uh, it's, it's something which doesn't actually uh, exist for a long period of time. Um, but, you know, I, it's, uh, the, the 40 to 60 60 percent is normally the one that you want to try and aim for unless it gets very cold, but I wouldn't humidify for it. I have heard some problems in, uh, in more Latin-based countries where they're actually using terminal units in the room which are which really do dry out the air in the summer, and I've heard problems about electric shock and so forth from uh, static electric 
um, yeah. uh, from, from from people in uh, in Spain, but it's more antidotal evidence rather than, uh, than any research that I've heard about. Yeah, that, that is an issue actually. Static electricity, which in a lot of cases can be solved by selecting the right kind of carpets. As some of them they are uh, uh, conductive, and other others are not. So that that's really something to look at. That's 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 a good point. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next question, what about the impacts of road and vehicle emission on indoor air quality? I, I, I'd like to start on that one, actually, because when I saw that question, it reminded me of something I was going to say. And, uh, I mean, most people think of Scandinavia being, you know, quite clean and uh, the, the outdoor air quality should be excellent here. Uh, but I can tell you at the moment there's two Swedish cities, I believe it's Stockholm and Malmo, which are being taken a call. Uh, in Europe because the outdoor air quality is so poor uh, in the central areas. Um, so, you know, road and vehicle emissions and IAQ, definitely, definitely a, a, a big problem. So uh, not that I would uh, recommend having uh, um, having natural ventilation in either of those cities in the winter because you're going to be jucking out too much heat energy. Um, but, uh, and, and that's, of course, when it occurs because we're using uh, studded tires to, uh, to combat with the, um, the, the ice and snow. Uh, and we have had a ban now on certain using studded tires in certain areas of the city, but it's still not quite enough. Um, so, yes, it is a huge impact. Yes, I would like to pick up on that theme. I think uh, the effects of road uh, vehicular emissions uh, on indoor air quality are quite profound and uh, certainly in the major cities in the UK um, it has, uh, well one of my slides referred, uh, a major impact on people's health and uh, when you're expecting to breathe air that uh, is clean enough uh, that you can breathe it without risk to health then the only thing that stands between you and those emissions uh, is an effective air filtration system and uh, that's why you know, the testing of air filters is important, uh, the recommendations for air filters are important, and the uh, integrity of the system in which they're installed is important because the best filter in the world will not clean the air if it is not properly engineered uh, into a, a mounting system that has full integrity uh, with no or very low leakage. Uh, and this is an absolutely critical area that uh, I find uh, I see on a a daily basis when I look into air handling units, um, there is quite often a shortfall um, which could do with addressing. So it is a very important issue and uh, both particulates and gas phase pollutants, certainly in London, are something that needs to be addressed. Thank you. And a related question about multi-storey buildings with indoor car parking. Any overarching um, impact on IAQ as well? Well, I, certainly in the car park you're going to have a, a problem. Uh, the effect of having a closed car park and frequently, uh, uh, certainly in cities, they have sort of under building car parks that are enclosed. You get a build up in concentration of uh, vehicle emissions and as a result you have to ventilate uh, and if you don't, then you're going to get all the problems in an even more concentrated form. So um, uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, the ventilation uh, requirements for this type of uh, environment uh, are significantly higher than uh, would be required for the uh, normal building uh, uh, in other parts where uh, um, people would not normally uh, uh, have... Uh, these sorts of problems. So it's, um, uh, it is an area that does need to be uh, ad addressed. Obviously people tend not to spend a lot of time in these areas but you do have to have um, a, a ventilation rate that will clear any buildup of this particular type of pollutant. So it would indicate a sensing system. For example, when everybody drives in first thing in the morning in their cars then you have to have a fan system that will um, displace the uh, polluted air uh, and so for the rest of the day the environment is much more uh, uh, suitable for people to breathe. Thank you. And uh, what about the impact of uh, cooking in indoor air quality? Um, do you want this one uh, at all? Well, I, I, can, I, I can start a little bit on this one, Peter, even yep. though uh, 
I'm sure you've you've done a, a, enough studies on this, but uh, yeah. Again, I, I'm just thinking about uh, you know what. There's there's lots of different ways people try try and deal with uh, improving the uh, IAQ uh, in, in restaurants. For example, I've seen uh, installations where they've retrofitted uh, uh, ozone generators mainly because they want to cut down the amount of uh, uh, say chimney sweep costs. Uh, for cleaning out the uh, the, uh, the extract ducting because the ozone breaks down the fat, and they don't have to have someone come in uh, every month and scrape out all the fat from the, from the burgers um, uh, in, in fast food restaurants. But again, that, that that needs reaction time, and you need to have the, the proper length of ducting to, to enable all the reaction times to take place. I, I'm not a great fan of ozone, but I, you know I appreciate why people use it. Uh, it's a very, very active gas and, and, and also creates lots of other uh, volatile organic com compounds when you mix it with, uh, with some sort of uh, something like fat. Um, so I think you need to be very careful when looking at this. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a great fan, but I do know that, that some people use it with rotary heat exchanges and you know, installed properly and looked at, it could be good. Um, so you, know, you, you need to really seriously consider, do I just want to extract uh, the air completely out and not have uh, and maybe accept a, a lower type of, of heat recovery um, and what you're trying you know really what, what you're trying to achieve uh, yeah. but you certainly should have a very good extraction from, from those areas Peter have you got anything to add? Well yes I was just um, it, it reminded me the other day I was in an atrium area of a large office block where they had a sort of cafe where they were producing um, you know, uh, uh, burgers and uh, coffee and that sort of thing. And in that particular area, the rest of the building was excellent, uh, fine particulate, about 4 million uh, particles per cubic meter. But in the area of this uh, um, facility, it was over 20 million. Uh, and you would expect, you know, in a pristine office, prestige office block in central London that uh, uh, you wouldn't have that sort of uh, uh, level of particulate. So it's important to have a good extract system that addresses the source of uh, any possible gas or, or particulate uh, from the cooking processes. It takes it away through a well-designed filter system that would include particulates, uh, a, a coarse grade to take out the oil droplets, that sort of thing, a secondary grade after that to take out the particulates, fine particulates, and a third uh, stage to uh, uh, have the uh, gas filtration to take out the odors uh, so it can be safely um, exhausted into atmosphere outside the building at high level. Um, maybe if I can add very shortly to that, this is uh, Atsabusa speaking. Yeah. Um, one thing you see in dwellings, when you cook in dwellings, is uh, if, you, if you cook on natural gas, like we do in the Netherlands, for example, you see uh, elevated concentrations of, for example, NOx, so it depends very much on, on how you cook, whether you do it electrical or not. Uh, personally, I like gas cooking because it's very fast, but uh, 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 of course you have induction uh, too. But if you use natural gas or, or, or fossil fuels like that, it's, uh, it gives you problem, other problems. And, and uh, referring to what the other said, we did some measurements of fine particle uh, concentration, and especially if you do the, the fast kind of cooking with like the Chinese style with a lot of oil, uh, then you get very high uh, fine particle concentrations, probably of oil uh, droplets. And uh, I think that's an underestimated health uh, risk. Uh, we, we had concentration of 400, 500 microgram per cubic meter. That's like 20 times higher than uh, outside. So uh, it's an important issue. Thank you, Atze. I think that's all the time we have for the questions for that part. And thank you very much, uh, Atze, uh, John, and um, Peter, for answering the questions. Most welcome. Okay. Thank you.